Just before 6.30 is the time now. You're tuned to your local station, BBC Radio Cornwall. For tonight's first guest, and that's Colin Wilson. And from his Cornish home, where he's lived since 1957, Colin has published some 80 books, which have encompassed philosophy, psychology, criminology, occultism, and not least fiction. He's widely read around the world, yet the metropolitan literary elites continue to ignore his work. Tonight he's coming to discuss some of the subjects he holds dear. Now, Colin, uh, some 80 books published, I think would be quite an achievement if they were all about car maintenance or cookery, perhaps. But you seem to have uh, embraced such a range of uh, very intellectual subjects for your writing. Which one do you hold most dear? Oh, I suppose, in a way, I think of myself as a philosopher, but I think of myself as an existentialist philosopher, which means that my basic interest, you know, is in human existence and the problem of why we're alive. So this explains why my work's covered such an enormous range, you know, from uh, philosophy and the so-called occult to um, criminology and even a book on wine. So you would describe yourself as a philosopher more than a psychologist, or, or as one journalist described you, as a sort of self-elected prophet? <laughs> yes, I'm basically a philosopher, I think. Yes, yes. And this, this very uh, modular form of, of, of uh, dis distributing your thoughts, if you like, would it have been better to develop just one of the ideas? Well, as I say, um, what fascinates me is a basic problem, one basic problem, and that is really the problem of the fact that at times like Christmas, we have this wonderful feeling, you know, particularly as children, that the whole world is glorious, you know, and you can't imagine anybody ever wanting to die. And then um, we suddenly feel that the whole thing was an illusion. We, we come back to Earth with a bump, and we wonder which was true. Van Gogh painted this thing, the starry night, full of a, a sort of tremendous explosion of sheer vitality and killed himself a year later, leaving a note saying, misery will never end. Well, which was true, the starry night or the suicide note, you see? That's the basic problem of all my work, what Carlyle ca called eternal yes versus eternal no. And your first work, the, the Outsider, was published in 1956. It made quite an impact then. Can you tell us what you're attempting to do with that? Well, what interested me was the fact that so many of these people of the 19th century, like Van Gogh, had died insane or committed suicide or died in stupid accidents. They'd obviously finally decided that the eternal no was the truth and that the eternal yes was a pleasant illusion, like getting drunk. Now, I felt this was just not true. And what I wanted to do was to analyse these people and try to find out whether, you know, you can say human life is hopelessly tragic or meaningless or futile, or, you know, is there some meaning to it? Now, that's what all of my work is about, in a sense. And in The Outsider, I analysed lots of these people, most of them dating from the 19th century, and I came up with a conclusion that the basic problem with most of them is simply that they killed themselves or died out of self-pity rather than out of any genuine problem. In other words, that if we get rid of the self-pity and really make an effort, we'd be capable of far more. And this is what human beings are supposed to do. In fact, I was convinced that man is now on the point of an evolutionary leap to a new stage. And that all of this sort of mess-ups that you find, uh, you know, in modern civilization, like these serial killers that this book is about, are in a weird sort of a way a symptom of this need of human beings to change, to do something. They're battering their heads against a brick wall, if you see what I mean. So how do we rid ourselves of this self-pity to lead a more constructive life? Well, I mean, one of the basic problems, and here we come to the centre of my work, is that for more than 200 years now, there's been a terrific cloud of pessimism hanging over Western culture. And nowadays, of course, you know, more blackly than ever, people like Samuel Beckett, you know, and so on. And uh, what I've been trying to say in all my work is that this pessimism is basically misconceived. It's basically a kind of schoolboy howler. Sartre, you know, said, it is meaningless that we live and meaningless that we die. Now, what I want to write about is the fact that, you know, it is not meaningless. Um, there is a meaning. So why do you think we've evolved with these preconceptions? Oh, um, that in a way was sort of inevitable. It um, happened simply because around about the year 1740, <clears throat> there was a very peculiar change that took place in the human race. A man called Samuel Richardson wrote what is virtually the first novel, in our modern sense of the word, a thing called Pamela. Pamela. 
which was almost a kind of soap opera. Previous novels had been things like Gulliver's Travels or Robinson Crusoe, you know, taking place in faraway places with strange sounding names. What Richardson did was to create a kind of magic carpet that readers could sit on and float away into other people's lives. They could cease to be themselves and become other people. And quite suddenly, this caused a terrific development of the imagination. It's, it would be very hard for you to understand what it would be like to be alive in the year 1700. If you could be transported back there by a time machine, you'd find it incredibly boring. <laughs> the people would just be stuck in the present moment and in their own lives and incapable of getting out of them. After Samuel Richardson, all this changed. But the change, of course, um, was also, in a way, rather a bad thing. Because as soon as you were capable of floating away <laughs> into the sort of eternal vapours, as soon as you were capable of getting out of your own life, you become very unwilling to get back into it. You, you become, in other words, shy of the sheer harshness of reality. And this was the problem with those outsiders of the 19th century. They'd developed what you might call reality sickness. It's a very interesting theory. Has it been developed by anyone else, as far as you're aware? Not, uh, not in that way, no. You see, the main problem with nearly all the kind of philosophers who developed this um, idea of, you know, that human existence is the basic problem, starting off with Kierkegaard in the mid-19th century, is that they've all tended to be pessimistic. They've all tended to end up with this notion that life is meaningless. You know, Kierkegaard said, um, a farmer sticks his finger into the earth to tell um, what country he's in. Uh, I stick my finger into existence and smell it, and it smells of nothing. What am I doing here? Who put me here? What, what, who, wh where's the director? I want to see the director. Yes. Well, this, this was the basic attitude, you see, of people in the 19th century, the great romantics. And, of course, they ended up with the feeling there's no director. The universe is empty, meaningless. Now, to me, this is a kind of absurdity. Um, I'm going to write a book about female outsiders um, over the course of the next year, and I got a very interesting letter from one of them the other day who'd sent me her novel, which I found sort of terribly negative. And when I said, look, I can't understand why you describe life in such a bleak, flat way, she said, well, that's the only way to describe it. There's no God. Life has no meaning. Why should I pretend to give it a meaning that doesn't exist? And I said, for heaven's sake, look, can't you see this? If you really want to find meaning, it comes in these strange moments when you're feeling fully alive and happy, and it's because your mind is seething. Whereas when you sit there feeling flat and dead, of course the outside world has no meaning. What is it supposed to have, you know? It's when you yourself, inside yourself, feel full of a certain kind of pressure, intensity, that we see meaning. And so the first problem must be, how can we pump up our inten intensity, just as if we were, you know, pressure lamps? And that, for me, is the great problem. What do you think of uh, Asaya, Asaya Berlin's work and, and his theories on, on the way society's evolved? Oh, he's an absolutely fascinating man. And, in fact, he said one thing, um, quoting uh, the German philosopher Fichte, which um, has always been, in a sense, the foundation of my work. He quoted Fichte as saying, um, to be free is nothing. To become free is heavenly. And we all know this to be true. And you, I, say, you say Fichte, who, uh, who, uh, who else are your influences? Um, well, I suppose uh, when I was young, uh, T.S. Eliot and Bernard Shaw, oddly enough, these two. But because they were both asking the same question, you know, why are we alive? What are we doing here? Eliot said, where is the life we've lost in living? And that, to me, is the real problem, that human beings waste their lives. And yet we get these odd moments, that's what fascinates me, when suddenly everything glows, everything's real, and we get the feeling that life is not a waste after all. Um, one of the greatest influences on me was an American psychologist called Abraham Maslow. And just after The Outsider came out, he wrote me a letter saying that as a psychologist, he got sick of studying sick people because sick people talked about nothing but their sickness. And so instead of that, he started to study healthy people, mm -hmm. which no psychologist has ever thought of doing. And what happened was that he discovered that all healthy people had, with a fair degree of frequency, what he called peak experiences, experiences of sudden bubbling, overwhelming happiness. And no one had ever discovered this before. He also found that when he talked to his students about peak experiences, they began remembering peak experiences they'd had in the past and, and more or less half forgotten about, but also they began having peak experiences all the time as soon as they began to think and talk about them. And so, quite obviously, here's a method, you see, of achieving these states of intensity. You think about them, you discuss them, 
And when you do that, you begin to have them. And have you managed to develop your own intellectual life through uh, uh, having these peak experiences? Well, yeah. I suppose uh, my intellectual life has been based on the fact that when I was a child, I had a lot of peak experiences. I'd have these overwhelming experiences, experiences of sheer joy and happiness. And then um, find myself, as I say, the next day thinking, what was all that about? Was it true or not? And in my teens, when I began to read a lot of poetry and listen to a lot of music, I saw this even more clearly. Does music tell you lies? There's that uh, old punch joke of a little boy saying to his father as a military band march marches past, Daddy, why does military music make you feel so much happier than you really are? <laughs> yes. This is the question. Is it than you really are? At the end of Camus' novel, The Outsider, L'Etranger, the hero about to be executed has a sudden overwhelming feeling of sheer joy and says, I suddenly realized I'd been happy and I was happy still. Yet can you be happy and not know you're happy? Which is what's implied. That's what fascinates me. How do we get below the surface of consciousness to these weird depths of happiness which we all contain? Because at the moment our civilization badly needs this. I should certainly like to know the trick, I would. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about conceiving ideas. Now, do your theories come from studying the work of your influences? Do you, do you formulate your ideas via uh, either developing another one or perhaps disagreeing with it, with a suggestion? How do they come to fruition? Oh, no, it all came about, as I say, to begin with, with this fascination with what I called then the Christmas feeling when I was a child. And the, the real question was, how could you maintain the Christmas feeling for the rest of the year? In due course, this turned into the outsider, where the Christmas feeling became, you know, Van Gogh's feeling with the starry night, or Nijinsky, the dancer, writing, I am God, I am God, and yet going insane afterwards. This, for me, was the great question. Nietzsche saying that the answer lay in his Zarathustra, you know, in the notion of great health, and yet dying insane. This, for me, was the great question, which is true, great health or insanity? And so, of course, I developed it in book after book. I became fascinated in the historical aspect of it, why man developed in this particular way. Um, saints and mystics had always had these sudden peak experiences, these feeling of a blazing immense reality, but it wasn't until the 18th century that people started having them with any frequency. And as I say, I'm pretty sure it's because of the invention of the novel, but that has also caused awful problems. For example, the first thing you do when you develop your imagination is to use it for sexual purposes and you suddenly discover this explosion of sexual perversion that takes place in the late, 19, uh, late 18th century, you know, with the Marquis de Sade, and during the 19th century. You know, believe it or not, there was almost no sexual perversion before that date. So should we learn how to use our imagination a little better, perhaps? Well, that is the question. That's the great question you've just asked. And I suppose you could put it in another way and say, how could we have peak experiences at will? This is the question which, in a way, has preoccupied me all my life. And it is, in a sense, a matter of using the imagination. Um, we're always getting strangely stuck. Our reality tends to narrow around us into a kind of tunnel vision. And then we are taken in by this tunnel vision, and we say, like Sartre, man is a useless passion. Now, what we have to do somehow is to grasp intellectually this basic vision of the mystics to try to translate it, so to speak, into ordinary, everyday language, which we can understand when we are in our ordinary moods, and then somehow get it through to the deeper levels of the unconscious mind. You know, Auden says in a poem, the centre that I cannot find is known to my unconscious mind. I have no reason to despair because I am already there. Now, what we've got to do somehow is to learn about that centre of the unconscious mind. And as I say, Maslow proved it, by showing that when his students talked to one another about peak experiences, they began having them all the time. The real key to the question lies in that. So is fantasy a reality? Um, well, the main problem is, you see, you can't make that lovely, clear distinction. When I was in my teens and reading poetry all the time, my parents used to accuse me of escapism. And I used to say, you know, it's not escapism, it's an escape to a deeper reality. And yet the fact is, of course, that it unfits us for ordinary, everyday reality. I call this the Bombard effect, you know, after that man, Alan Bombard, who tried to sail across the Atlantic in a rubber dinghy. Yes. And do you remember, halfway across the Atlantic, he went on board a ship that wanted to know what he was doing there and made the mistake of eating a normal meal. 
of egg and bacon. And when he got back into his rubber dinghy and went back to his meal of squashed fish and plankton and seawater, he vomited for days and almost died. Now, this is my image of these outsiders of the 19th century. They had these visions of ecstasy and delight and then find themselves vomiting when they came to the squashed fish and plankton of ordinary everyday life. So how do you stop yourself being disillusioned when you, you come to the exciting conclusion of your fantasies? Ah, that's not um, the real question. It's not a question of um, disillusionment at all. You see, what was wrong with those outsiders of the 19th century was that they turned their back on ordinary existence and allowed themselves to become weak, to become self-pitying. You know, the feeling that you get, if you try to read a very long novel in a single sitting, you know that strange feeling of unreality you tend to get as you plough through its last pages until you're not quite sure whether something, you know, really happened or whether you dreamed it? We get into that state of mind if we spend too long in this mental world. So what we have to do is to develop this curious ability to, as it were, get back to the physical world with a bang with a, no doubt whatsoever that it is basically good. Now, the trouble with all those 19th century people is that they thought the physical world is not good. They had this deep mistrust, this feeling that human life is meaningless. Now, if we can once establish, so to speak, once and for all, you know, philosophically, that human life is not meaningless, then we've already broken through. We've already, as it were, smashed through that barrier that lies between us and this next step in evolution. I believe, in a certain sense, we've taken that step, but we don't yet know it. And sometime over the next 50 years, um, the consciousness of it will become so general that we shall create a different kind of man, something much closer to the Superman. Very interesting thought. Let's move on to criminology and the uh, psychology of violence, which is a, another of your interests. The most recent work is The Serial Killers, which is a, a co-authorship with a journalist called Donald Seaman. Now, this is based on your research into American murders. What, uh, or m American murderers, what conclusions did you, you come to about their motivation? Well, what happened, you see, is that around about um, 20 years ago, a new kind of murderer began to appear. People who kill lots and lots of people very casually. Although, in a sense, um, our Jack the Ripper was one of the very first serial killers. But over the past 20 years, they've proliferated in America. So, you know, there are literally dozens of them. I mean, there could be as many as 500 wandering around at the moment. And the highest score, so to speak, is 360 people that one of them killed. So, you know, we're dealing with enormous numbers. Now, it's almost impossible to catch a serial killer in the normal way. That is, you know, by trying to track down the link between the victim and the killer, because he kills casually. Um, the police in Canada rang up the FBI and said, look, we've got a very peculiar murder case here. Uh, girls are being found dead in the woods, and uh, a man has obviously been hunting them like animals with a hunting rifle and killing them. Um, we suspect a man who is, and the FBI said, stop. Don't tell us any more about the man you suspect, just tell us about the murders themselves. They described the murders in some detail, and at the end of, the end of it, the FBI said, well, we think that what you are de dealing with is a man probably approaching middle age. Um, he's probably a successful local businessman. He has a stutter. And the police said, my God, he's our leading suspect. And they got him, a man called Hansen, in this way. Now, that kind of thing is incredible. And they do it by studying dozens of cases, very often actually interviewing the murderers in prison, and they find that uh, these amazing similarities come up. Did you, did you find anything in common with these people? Were there, was there anything consistent amongst them? Yep, um, and there are two major things there. Um, the first thing is that all serial killers belong to what has been called the dominant 5%. In all animal groups, one in 20 is dominant. And this applies to birds, fishes, human beings, animals, the lot. Uh, secondly, one of the odd things about... Um, serial killers is that they all look, belong to a group that the writer Van Vogt has called right men or violent men. They are people, men, who build their lives on a kind of fantasy of aggrandizement, self-aggrandizement, and will never under any circumstances admit that they are in the wrong. If you actually push them into a corner and show them they're in the wrong, they'd rather hit you in the face than admit it. Saddam Hussein, incidentally, is a typical example. Um, Hitler um, is a typical example. And Right men do have this curious attitude towards women, a sort of violent attitude. They're living in a curious little tower of self-deception. And uh, nearly all the serial killers I've studied, in fact, I should say all of the serial killers I've studied, have been right men.
So you begin to discover these curious similarities. Things begin to fall together. Another interesting thing, in a case like the Moore's murder case, where you have two people concerned, you know, in that case, Ian Brady and Myra Hindley, and I've come across many other cases, as it were, of um, these uh, killer couples, as well as that. What tends to happen is that you have one of the partners who is highly dominant, usually the man, and a person who is of much lower dominance. And the high dominance person so enjoys the sensation of having someone else, as it were, completely under his thumb, willing to do anything he wants her to do, that he'll go further and further, much further than he would go on his own. It's almost certain that Brady would never have committed a murder if he hadn't managed, as it were, to grab Myra Hindley. But he pushes her, first of all, into being an atheist, you know, when before that she's a good Catholic, into reading the Marquis de Sade, um, into posing for pornographic pictures, and it's a question of how far can I push her to prove my power, because that's what it's all about, power. And what he does is to push her into the murder of children. And this is one of the principles of basic human relationships, of course, too, isn't it? Yep, I'm afraid this, um, this is true. But very often, if you get a high dominance person mixed up with a medium dominance person, and it's often a sort of perfectly good relationship, you know, if they, can, if they can work it out. They give one another, you know, what the other one needs. It's only in the case of the criminal mentality that it almost invariably explodes into murder when this particular mixture gets together, like n nitroglycerin. Mm. Let's move on again to occultism, um, another of your studies. What conclusions did you draw from studying it and the people who uh, practised it or, or participated within it? Well, what happened there was that I was asked um, in the mid-60s if I would be willing to write a book about the occult because there was this enormous occult explosion just taking place. And I thought, you know, that it was basically all rather nonsense. <laughs> I, I expected, when I really got down to studying it, that I'd have to write the book with my tongue in my cheek because I'd find that it was all wishful thinking. Now, what I very quickly discovered was that this was a total mistake. To begin with, most of the people... Um, who'd had these experiences were not believers, they were unbelievers who'd had just one peculiar experience. And for example, Osbert Sitwell describes in his autobiography how just before the First World War, he and a group of fellow officers went along to a, a palmist as a lark. And the palmist looked at their palms one after the other and got more and more puzzled. And Sitwell said, what's the matter? And she said, admitted to him, their palms are empty. Well, Sitwell found the reason, of course, a few months later when the war broke out and the people with empty palms were the ones who were killed in the war. So this kind of thing deeply impressed me because Sitwell is not only an unbeliever, his father was a famous unbeliever who'd unmasked a medium. So little by little I began to see that what we're dealing with are faculties that really exist, human faculties, which we have suppressed. Um, the tiger hunter Jim Corbett was always able to tell when a tiger was lying in wait for him in the jungle. Um, he called it jungle sensitiveness. Now, most animals also possess the same peculiar power, but we human beings have deliberately repressed that power because we don't need it. You know, there aren't any tigers lying in wait for us sort of in the supermarket. The result is we've got rid of it. But a man called um, Peter van der Herk, a Dutchman, fell off a ladder and smashed his skull. And when he woke up in hospital with concussion, he realised that he could read the minds of the other people around him in the hospital. And when he shook the hand of a man who was leaving the hospital, he knew with absolute certainty that that man was a British agent who, who would be murdered within the next few days by the Gestapo. And he told somebody this, and it almost cost him his life, because the Dutch resistance assumed he was a traitor and came along to kill him. It was a hell of a job for him to convince them that he really had second sight. Now, that man discovered that the problem with his second sight is that it prevented him from doing a normal job. He was like a radio set receiving ten stations at the same time. His mind was a, a sort of babbling confusion. And until he discovered that he could use this to make a living by going on the stage and reading people's minds, and he called himself Peter Herkos, um, he, he would have starved to death. So what happened when he bumped his head? Well, what had happened was that he'd, as it were, short-circuited himself back into this curious faculty which we have deliberately repressed. And it's funny, I've discovered that again and again, in the case of so-called psychics, They've had some experience. Uri Geller, for example, had an extremely bad electric shock when he was a child that knocked him out. And it was after this that his faculties developed.
It's very interesting indeed. Yeah. That leads us on to the, the final thing I wanted to cover. Not a subject which you uh, study, but I should be very interested to know your feelings on religion as a man who's uh, studied the inner life for so long. What are your feelings on religion, Colin? Well, I suppose in a sense, um, I've always been sort of basically a religious sort of person, but not in the Christian sense of the word. Um, it, I, my second book was called Religion and the Rebel, and it was mainly about religious mystics. Um, the French philosopher Bergson said there are two kinds of religion, which he called open religion and closed religion. Open religion is the religion of the saints and the mystics. Closed religion is the sort of religion of, you know, thou shalt not, and dogmas. And he said, you know, real religion is open religion. Now, in that sense, I think nearly all of the sort of great minds have always been religious in the sense of open religion very few of them in the sense of closed religion. And I would, in a sense, describe myself as a kind of mystic. Obviously, what obsesses me is this mystical experience that Van Gogh had. So, in fact, as you know, Van Gogh himself, um, at one point, uh, became a pastor and went into the Barinage, the um, coal mining area of Belgium, um, to um, try and become a kind of a saint. So there's always this close connection between outsiders and saints. And as you know, the last line of my outsider is that a person may begin this long journey as an outsider, he may finish it as a saint. So you could say that religion is, in a sense, at the foundation of all my work. So if you had to define this open religion in a few sentences, how could you do that? It's this um, sudden strange feeling of an immense reality outsiders. It's almost as if human beings were like somebody sitting in an aeroplane reading a book, when all they have to do is to glance out of the window and see some immense vista of mountains unfolding below them. Um, people, the open religious people, are people who put down the book and look out of the window of the aeroplane. Colin Wilson, thank you very much indeed. Colin's most recent publication is uh, The Serial Killers, A Study of the Psychology of Violence. It's published by W.H. Allen in hardback at £12.99. And uh, there's also a biography on Colin, which is written by Howard Dosser, and uh, that's published by Eminent in paperback at £9.99. <laughs>